historically uh, biotech is very bro-ish. So one project, a collaboration uh, with White Feather Hunter and Lyra, uh, we grow clitoris from menstrual de- menstruation blood derived stem cells. Yeah, and we, we made a video and it's uh, it's a pretty interesting video. We uploaded it to OnlyFans, and on OnlyFans, people can follow the story of the clitoris. It starts with just taking that leap. Man, you have to work hard. You have to be incredibly smart. Choose something that even if it fails, even if it fails you are going to be proud of it. doesn't matter how badly you got beaten in that. Be kind, be kind, be kind. Become a better person, a better leader, a better business. Go with your gut. I'm Samuel Donner, and this is Finding Founders. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Jabali's bioengineered clitoris is just the tip of what she's capable of as an artist, designer, inventor, and professor. From a stint at Harvard to China's 30 Under 30 to TED Talks on how technology mediates how we perceive reality, Jabao's multidisciplinary approach to life flows into her art. She's able to pull from her experience at Google, founding experience with three companies, and numerous art exhibitions to bring innovative and unusual ideas to life. However, she wasn't always an artist. She started to be an engineer. So let's go back to the beginning of her early life in Shenyang, China. It's a northeast uh, city in China. It's very cold, uh, heavy, polluted, very industrialized city. Thinking of my role now as an artist, Shenyang is the furthest place that <laughs> are away from my role as an artist. Um, there's maybe one or two museums, and they're all very traditional, old, antiquated stuff. Um, and it's uh, historically, it, it's an industri- um, heavy industry uh, city. Um, so uh, especially during the winter, it, the pollution is like the PM 2.5 is like 200. I graduated from Northeast East High High School. I'm, I kind of, I think I live in a very typical Chinese student there <laughs> in a way. Yeah, so what does that mean? Uh, you study really hard. Every single second, you have to be on the way of studying or study. And you prepare for all the exams um, every day, all the time. Your parents were engineers. Like, what Was there expectation that you would also become an engineer? Exactly. They really want me to be an engineer. Um, that's why a, lit, a part of the reason that I was studying electrical and computer engineer um, in my undergrad. Were you expressing this creativity and this artistry early or was that something that came later? Yeah, I uh, studied uh, painting, drawing, dancing, uh, singing, like all kinds of uh, art mediums since five year old. Um, it's actually, uh, I'm really thankful to my mom. At that time, in my family, there's a huge, um, uh, like, you, you need to spend money to ed- educate the boys. But I'm the only child with only child policy. Um, she uh, stepped out of her way and spent a lot of time and financial, like at the time that um, they were not rich, they're um, relatively not rich. And uh, were able to spend all the time to educate me in this this uh, realm. In the realm of arts or the realm of engineering? In, in the realm of, of art. Even though all the metrics of those testing scores are all around math and engineering, science, all of that. Um, and then I was, uh, throughout my uh, student life, I was the, I don't know what's the English word for that. It's like pr- propaganda um, committee. <laughs> Propaganda <laughs> comedy? What's it, that? It's like you are in charge of all the propaganda in the school. <laughs> uh, like you, it's it's like a different era now. Um, you draw all the whiteboard or blackboard. You, uh, it's like the early graphic design. Um, it's all through hand drawing or just cutting. You invent font on the go and just by cutting. So font. it's almost like school spirit, like lead and stuff, right? Like where you're you're like showing, you're like making things look fun for the student body. You, uh, I don't know if it's exactly the the equivalent, uh, but everything you see around the campus, it's like you draw them and you you put them up and you need to be creative about it. When you're making these, uh, uh, like like decorating the school um, and doing these projects, was there any part of you that was like, maybe this art thing could be my full-time thing? Like, 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 do I really want it? be studying engineering like where did any of those thoughts come up in high school uh no 
still teen high school. No. So in high school, you're like, this is a fun side thing, but engineering, like computer science, electrical engineering, that's, that is, that is what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. Cause I was in this class called math specialty class. You study math for, to complete in, to compete in the Olympic math. And uh, so it's like, it's very math and science oriented. When you were going through high school, when you're and looking towards college, like what are you thinking that you want to do with your life? I know some sort of something related to technology. Um, I always even think about, uh, I, I, I was actually also interested in poetry, even history, uh, something creative in the art and design, but that's more like a desire. Yeah. So the, and then it's like, no, your parents are like, what are you talking about? Poetry? No way. <laughs> yeah. Is that what they were like? Is that what they, did you have any conversations with them? Like what did they say? Yeah, they're like, uh, en- engineer, it's, it's the best um, <laughs> major. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what my parents said, too. I studied mechanical engineering. And so they were like, uh, either you study engineering or you study nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what? So when you uh, were looking at colleges, what kind of colleges were you looking at? Were you looking at stuff within China or were you looking abroad? All over in China, abroad, and then there's this opportunity come up uh, from Singapore. Um, they have scholarships, and uh, I was on an exchange to Singapore in middle school. Um, so a Singaporean friend came over to our school and lived in our place, and then we went to Singapore, and that gave me a really good impression about Singapore and the university. Yeah. So what what was different about? Because you're coming from this city where it's like you said, it's super industrial, like polluted. When you go to Singapore, how is it different? Like, what's your impression of the city? What is it like? It's completely the, the opposite. Uh, it's warm, humid. Uh, it's a city in a garden, garden city. I say rebranded, Singapore rebranded. Um, and uh, so much green space. People speak different language, a lot of diversity. Um, they teach in very different ways. So much more hands-on than the- theoretical. When you get there, like, are you instantly doing projects and engineering? Like, how are you? How are you able to express or explore your interests when you get to college? I did like something like bridging course, uh, it's bridging middle school and college, and that's a time that really so much of the art world, the creative world, opened up to me. Uh, it's like you you open you open a, a box and like everything just come to your face. I think that's my early exposure of the creative world. What what did you see? Like, what were you exposed to? What were you inspired by? A lot of uh, interesting museum, art science museum. That was really good one. Um, uh, contemporary art, because uh, there, there's no such museum in Xinjiang. Back to the city where I come from, uh, and uh, some of our professors, uh, some of them even they are English professor. They are really into art, so they took us to a lot of uh, guided tours in various new exhibitions. What were like? What were some of the projects that you did in school? That uh, like, w- were there any early projects that allowed you to blend this love of arts and uh, uh, and like fine art with engineering? What you were studying? I think one is um, the Wiki House. Um, that that was a really fun one. That was actually during my exchange in Germany uh, in Abate Aachen. Um, where we build uh, CNC mill wood, like uh, sheets of wood, and then three people can put it up in 24 hours. Um, so you can like, just do a design and then you mill it, and they are just boards, and then without even nail and just uh, the, the kind of structure, uh, you can put it up. And what were, like, what were you creating like, when you put it together? What was, what was being made? Uh, some are housing. You can actually, it, it can be bedroom, living room. Some are like instant pop-up shops. Wow. Yeah. And for housing, uh, we even, we have all the electricity set up. We have AC on. So you can actually live there for a month or even more. So you were building full-on houses. Well, it's a big team. It's just not just me. <laughs> yeah, but that's incredible. What was it like to see something that was like in your head be fabricated and uh, exist in the world? Like, how did that feel? I mean, be able to ship something and people live in there. It's it's a great feeling, and that's that's really the project I I get to use both design, engineering, and art skills. 
Um, another project is actually also uh, similar, it's Solar Decathlon. It's uh, you build a house and uh, everything is powered through solar energy and uh, you recycle all the water um, and it's all net zero uh, carbon footprint. Um, and we compete in Datong uh, back in China. That one was a Singapore, uh, a US project. That's super cool. So after school, I, I guess I want to talk about um, the the sea in Sing uh, Singapore because I feel like all of this is amalgamating and getting closer to the the, the creative work that that you'd be doing. Yeah, so C was my first job uh, fresh out of college. Uh, at the time, it's called Garena. It's the largest um, online platform that includes both shopping, gaming, uh, payment in Southeast Asia. And uh, I was doing a lot of the product design, user experience, uh, user interface. Um, and that was the key transition of graduating from an engineering program and to be a designer, get into the creative field. And that was very early uh, stage at that time. Now the company is huge. Uh, yeah. It's all over Southeast Asia. But you were at like the, the ground floor. Mm -hmm. And and what, what kind of stuff were you, you making? Uh, I was designing um, one is a payment app called Alipay. I think they changed the name now. Um, and uh, it's, it's like PayPal-ish. Um, and so, so uh, 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 everything about the app. Uh, and we were traveling to different countries in Southeast Asia to know about the user behavior in different countries. It's all very different. I mean, use, they use different language. And so how did you transition from that into your uh, MIT Media Lab? Uh, because, I, and, and I want to talk about like how you were the first runner up for the hacking art thing and like, like what did you actually make? Mm. Yeah, uh, I quickly get bored with a job <laughs> <laughs> with a, as a you uh, a product UI, uh, UI UX and product lead. Uh, so I applied. I took a summer school in Harvard and loved it. Uh, and so I applied and get into Harvard and Harvard MIT. They can cross registrate. So I also took a lot of classes at MIT and research in Media Lab, um, and that opened up uh, so much of the creative or interaction design or HCI world to me. Um, I especially like one class called How to Make Almost Anything uh, by Neil Gershenfield. And after the class, you believe, at least you believe you can make almost anything. <laughs> That's incredible. Like, did you just feel like the world was open? And like, what, what would you start making? Uh, well, you were asking about the the uh, ha the hackathon, um, the VR hackathon. That one we made... A VR experience that you can feel empathy uh, of the people, the refugee getting out of Syria. And so you hop on a boat um, and try to get out of the country. And there was some decision you make and maybe the boat will submerge into the ocean, will wreck or not. And it take on you through that whole journey. Uh, and at MIT and Harvard, oh, oh my God, so many projects. Uh, where should I even start? Wherever you want to. <laughs> I think um, uh, my thesis, Transvision, is a pretty interesting one. I made a three perception machine to let people feel, to put into a very extreme uh, condition of how the ultimate augmented world feels like. And one is um, hyper allergic vision, where when you wear the helmet, it will give you the allergy feeling to the color red. Uh, so whenever you look at red, the red will expand and it's similar to social media's amplification effect. Like when you are feeling angry to something, you share memes and messages and uh, photos and then other people have the same opinion, tend to comment on it and you share and you blow up. Like the trivial stuff may blow up. And maybe that's why we are in living in the politics of anger. And also have a shrinking effect where it's almost like we unfollow people uh, with the opinion that are different than us so that we shrink uh, our we, our uh, information landscape and in a way that um, we is uh, like the, the, it's like to the two modes of the helmet the placebo and the nocebo the unfollow is like a cure to get out of the people who are have different opinion than us but that make human society highly uh, separated and become very binary 
um, isolated. And the other helmet is um, commoditized vision, where you can earn money by looking at advertisement and spend money by looking at an ad free world. And you, so you wear it, and you, you, when you look at advertisement, your eyes also turn red, and then your eyes are refreshed when you look at that ad free world. So you have to really constantly switching between earn money or spending the money that you earned, and um, so that you can have a little bit, bit a little bit of time to contemplate, to contemplate the world. And so, what, what were you trying to like make people understand about the world through these projects? It's, that one is about how technology mediates the way we perceive reality. Um, so the reality we see is not really the reality. It's, our, it's, go, it's coming through our perception. And this can be mediated by so many different things. One is the technology. Uh, some we can say it's the glasses. After I wear it, I don't feel it anymore because they are designed to disappear. Um, others could be our inherent physical uh, differences, uh, even like how all my organs are situated, or even between species, between human and non-human species, uh, our um, different womb world, the way we different, uh, how, how we perceive the world differently. So how did it feel to like create these things and like put them into existence? Uh, you get to learn a lot. Uh, you put yourself into the shoe of others. Uh, you try to defamiliarize uh, yourself because one way that we ignore this uh, mediation is because we are so familiarized with it. So one thing that art can do is to make it super weird and defamiliarize so we can stand a bit dis distance and look back again and see how like you, it's almost easier to see reality for what it is when we see it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you take that beyond Harvard? And uh, I mean, maybe to like the VR and AR international summits and then eventually Apple. So after Harvard, I joined Apple. Uh, I first joined as an intern and then returned Um my first project was actually working on the Apple Vision Pro <laughs> during Whoa. my internship and also after. Wow. Yeah. So so what was it like working on that? So I started seven, six years ago before the release. So it's been a long year of making. Yeah. Um, at a very early stage, we were exploring almost all kinds of technologies. And this is really a device that all different kinds of technology come together and uh, they they orchestrate so well and uh, user experience wise it's just like none other product before um, we were kind of joking that Arculus feels like a student project <laughs> comparing to Apple Vision Pro yeah I mean because Apple does it way better than anyone else it's like it, like like all the other all the other headsets are are, are totally like hackathon projects <laughs> comparatively <laughs> especially yeah um, we started with a lot of um, what are the kind of canonical use cases, why we even put such a thing in front of your face. So co-location, I think it's a very important one. Uh, you being in the same space together, either living through the experience or uh, work together. Um, and uh, continuous, uh, continue seamless transition between different devices, or uh, at least right now we are when we are still using phone and computer. Uh, how do you use wearing it but still uh, doing this? And another one, actually, I feel really strongly about is uh, on the airplane to take you uh, away from the uh, the chores, the chaos of uh, everything on the airplane, and you can just um, watch a movie or work there. And a lot of uh, 3D design creative tools uh, like 3D modeling or uh, live in an Airbnb um, or redesign a house and architecture. Because you, you are, we've been making 3D work on a 2D screen, but it makes more sense to make 3D work in a 3D world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that is something I'm imagining using it for, just having all of my screens just like in massive modes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, like, like as you, cause you worked there for a couple of years, but as you were there, like, how did you start to dive further into your art practice? Uh, I, I can't stop making, I can't stop creating. So beside doing Apple work, um, there's this part of me really want to 
jump into the more crazy and abstract art world. Uh, and sometimes they actually complement with each other. Like I was working on a lot of the climate initiative work at Apple. So, and that is the time that I work a lot on the ecology climate side of the artwork and they, they inform each other. Um, when I was in Silicon Valley, I would say a lot of my work are related to talking about technology and their impact on society, on individuals, on the mediation. Uh, so a lot of like how they mediate the way we perceive reality or uh, AI's impact. Um, and then during the pandemic, um, I get to live outside of the Bay Area uh, in Hawaii, wow. in Alaska. That's awesome. <laughs> and so in Alaska, I created a lot of work around glaciers. I get to visit glaciers every week and witnessing their recession. It's so sad. And I, I feel the responsibility to create a lot of climate work around that. Um, and in Hawaii, I get to spend a lot of time with the Hawaiian bobtail squid and the octopus. So I also create some work around that. Yeah, can you tell me about those projects? Yeah, uh, for the squid, uh, the Hawaiian bobtail squid, it's actually, uh, I was working with uh, Kevalo Marine Biology Lab, and while the scientists were working there, I noticed the squid just living in these boring white tanks all day long. So I wonder if I could make their environment more interesting by building playground for them. So I collected white and black sand from Hawaii Islands, make them into the shape of China and US. <laughs> and <laughs> while the squid was living in there, he carries the sand back and forth, reshaping the borders and traversing the countries without a visa or a passport. And after a month, the squid completely reinterprets these human-made borders and maps from the squid's perspective. In a way, it kind of reminds me as an immigrant moving between China and U.S., carrying the baggage of the two cultures, trying to blend in, but kind of find myself into this situation like the squid. Oh, by the way, the squid used this cute little tentacles to push the sand on his face as a camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> That's super cute. So like, what, what do you feel like when you, when you do a project like that, like how are you internalizing it emotionally? Is it a way for it to, to, to explore something about your own identity? Like why, why do a project like that? When you look at the squid in that situation, you can't help but just think, I don't want to imprint myself. In, onto the squid, still on the squid to have agency. The squid is not forced into that situation. It's living in its its life, like, like yeah, his yeah. life, like, like his him on. Um, and I mean, there are multiple layers of this work. Like one, it's seeing myself. The other, it's talking about the livelihood of the squid. Like they, a lot of the wild animals have to sit, take a side. Uh, these border walls that we build between countries can um, can uh, stop, can uh, hin hinder the migration of a lot of wild animals. For example, in El Paso, in Texas, they built these border walls between U.S. and Mexico. And when they designed it, they designed a hole that ha can have small animals to pass through. But then when they actually built it, they fill in the hole. So no, no small animal can pass through. <laughs> so I, I think a lot of this work with animals, where I, I call it interspecies co-creation, uh, it's important to really address the problems that these uh, non-human species are facing. With um, uh, the Alaska Glacier piece, can you tell me a little bit about like what was the impetus behind that? Yeah, uh, so I, I go on glaciers every week and um, while after a hike for seven hours, uh, my friend who grew up in front of that glacier told me where we started was where the glacier was when she was a kid. And I can't help just crying into the cold, in the cold wind of the glacier. Uh, the recession is just so visible. Um, so I started by creating a music and dance piece from the glacier melting data in the past 60, 60 years um, uh, with the musicians and dancers who grow up in front of a glacier witnessing the recession over their lifetime. So the, gla the glacier melting data, the glacier's own sound, and the uh, uh, artists leave the experience now into a uh, glacier's lament. Um, I also created a virtual reality film called Once a Glacier, um, that tells the story of a girl and her effort to try to save the last piece of glacier ice. Um, and it was auctioned, it was in the museum later. People say this is the last glacier in the world. Um, and that also got inspiration from uh, in Inupiaq uh, tradition, glaciers carry their memories through their songs. But as uh, climate change caused glaciers to di disappear, these song histories are also disappearing. And we 
uh, went on a lot of the different glaciers in Alaska and recorded all their sound uh, in real time. And there's this particular sound, it's like it's chirping. Uh, it feels like forest or bird, but it's none of that. It's simply just ice bursting into bubbles, uh, bursting in into each other. And we couldn't find any word in English or Chinese to describe this sound. But then later we found that in the indigenous language, the word tagish both is in the name of their tribe and also means the sound of the breakup of ice. So like how our language is shaping our way of perceiving reality, perceiving nature. So when you um, when you create these pieces, like where are they going? Cause, I mean, your your work has been exhibited everywhere. What are some of the uh, like, like, do you remember hearing that your work was going to be exhibited at maybe a particular museum? You're like, oh, my goodness, like, I can't believe it. And what was the piece? I'm not really coming from a traditional art background. I'm like engineering, design, and art. So they are shown in multiple channels. Uh, of course, uh, museum exhibitions, galleries, that's the art. And then uh, in a lot of conferences or even tech conference like SIGGRAPH, CHI, um, and then design, there's various design exhibition awards. So those three different channels. Um, and um, for museum exhibition, um, I really love the opportunity to show some of the work at the Biodesign Challenge at Museum of Modern Art in New York, mm -hmm. and also the Trans Species Design uh, at uh, Venice Architecture Biennale uh, last year. Um, and my recent solo exhibition at Dunde Art Museum in China with um, three floors of work, the whole museum wow. building. Wow. Yeah, can you tell me about how that solo exhibition came about? Yeah, uh, it's called uh, Progenitorial Hysteresis. It's a, <laughs> it's a hard to understand name. Uh, <laughs> uh, Progenitorial is um, the, the ancestor of stem cells. And a lot of this exhibition, it's about stem cells, um, especially uh, the menstrual blood derived stem cells. And hysteresis is a status that uh, something already happened, but we haven't been aware uh, of this happening or the status haven't changed yet. And I think that's a lot, a lot of our perception around climate change, our policy around climate change intake, or even our relationship with the animals, uh, the animals that come before us on this earth. Um, that's where the progenitorial comes from. Um, and for the exhibition, there are three floors. The first floor, it's all about the climate, ecology, the surface of the planet. So my work's around bats, octopus, uh, squid, glaciers, um, a carbon farm we turn the CO2 you breathe into nutrition for algae, and then we harvest the algae to make bioplastics. And the se second floor, it's all about inside the womb. So every all the works around um, uh, har harvesting my menstruation blood and grow stem cell and derive uh, specialized cells like herb cell and neuron cell to grow new organs. Wait, um, so you grew, you grew other organs? Yeah. <laughs> So one project, a collaboration uh, with White Feather Hunter and Lyra, uh, we grow clitoris from menstrual de menstruation blood derived stem cells. How do you do that? Okay, so we, we collect uh, menstruation blood with a menstrual cup and then inside there, there are stem cells and we um, get we isolate the stem cell and then differentiate them into heart cell, cardiomyocyte and neural cell the brain cells, and which is the compos composite of a clitoris. Um, and then we 3D bioprint the structure of a clitoris and then grow these cells into that structure. So by, that, by doing that, we're able to grow a clitoris, a living clitoris that can both feel and think. And then we start to ask the question, is it a sentient being? Um, if you if you think it's a because uh, like technically technically it is if you think it's a sentient being then where are the ethics of sexuality if you use that clitoris to masturbate who am I having sex with um, <laughs> is it to myself wow. or is it to the other person who contributed their menstrual cell stem cell. Um, and uh, and we, we made a video and it's uh, 
It's pretty interesting video. We upload it to OnlyFans, and on OnlyFans, people can follow the story of the clitoris. Yeah, the 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 sentient clit, um, the pussification of biotech. Yes. Wow. Yeah, because there's so much study about male organs, and um, uh, historically, uh, biotech is very uh, bro-ish. So, um, like for example. We were inspired by uh, the study of the snake clitoris.、Uh, it's only recently discovered that the snake have clitoris and they have hemi clitoris, like they have two clit clitoris,、um, whereas the male counterparts are often well studied. And because they have clitoris,、uh, it's believed that snail sex it's not about、um, uh, force but about coercion and pleasure. Um, um, so like. Clitoris is, is important. <laughs> wait, so wait, the, the the like snake sex is about、uh, about like pleasure or like that that's what they've they they've done studies on. Yeah. So one conclusion is for the animals who have clitoris, their sex should be more about pleasure than being forced. Wow. I think that's that kind of would transition into the biotech stuff that you're exploring now with your your new company. So can you tell me a little bit、uh, about Endless Health? Yeah.、Uh, so with Endless House, we、uh, try to prevent people from、uh, heart disease. So、uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide, but eighty percent can be prevented through lifestyle change, and that's where we come in. We do two parts: testing.、Um, we test all the most important biomarkers to indicate、uh, your risk factor of getting heart disease. And then after testing,、uh, we give you scores, and then、uh, knowing your data, you are able to、uh, have a prevention plan and do lifestyle change. And that's the second part. We have AI coach to train you to get onto a better lifestyle. How how has like I guess the 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 beginning of this company been? Because you started in twenty twenty two with your husband. What has、uh, been the learnings? Like, what has been maybe some of your initial success stories? Would love to hear where the company is at today. So now we are partnering with、um, a lot of pharmaceutical companies to do、uh, mass screening, health screening for some of the clinical trials. You know, we are also doing many、uh, mass testing、uh, for tens of thousands of people、um, in the U.S. Some of them for free. Uh, so we are moving beyond a D two C business to a B two B, and there's this.、Uh, so the current status there's this、um, biomarker called LP little a, which indicates、uh, if you have that gene.、Um, it, it's a very genetic derived.、Um, if you have that、uh, LP little a high, you are four to five x more likely to have heart、uh, problem later in life,、um, and that's something that's new. That you can't、uh, change, or you can't cure with lifestyle change, or there's no drug to cure it.、Um, but now、uh, many pharmaceutical companies start to have that drug to cure this part, to decrease that biomarker,、um, and that uh, uh, involves a lot of clinical trial and health screening. And that's where we try, we test a lot of、um, uh, a lot, a huge amount of population、um, for that. Um, and our our goal is again it's that two part. We try to test as many as people as possible so that they can be in charge of their、uh, health. They know their health quantitatively because、um, uh, the the pl the plaque that build up in your arteries go up from your twenties to thirties to forties. It's not like only when you're old you get her problem. It's build up building up and. Through that whole years, if you know your biomarker better, you can uh, make uh, informed actions better. So, looking back at everything that you've done, like getting into the art world, getting into the engineering world, and now getting into health, like what advice do you think you would give like young entrepreneurs or artists on how to begin their journey? I think never stop creating and innovating. Uh, and sometimes you can surprise yourself what you can make. Curiosity is a big driven force、uh, of the new things that come out of this world.、Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Donner. Our audio editing team lead is Ashley Jimenez with support from Jessica Morales, Miley Lipton, Si Pan, Kenny Wright, Josie Yo, Matt Fernandez, and Merritt Hill. Our outreach and research team lead is Desiree Nunez with support from Marissa Granados, Monica Lee, Sarah Tiersma, and Yao Wu. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.